<clears throat> hey, it worked. Hey. All right. Sorry for the uh, confusion there, but um, we're still figuring out how this works too. <laughs> um, Naomi's going to send a, a notice on the other uh, live feed that we tried to do. Uh, so that you all know that there's a new one now. Apparently, once you close one by accident, you have to start a new one. So there we are. <clears throat> all right, we'll give everybody just a little bit of time to find their way over here, and then uh, we'll get started. Sorry, this is the first time we've done this, so we're kind of trying to figure it out. Hope everybody's having a great evening. We've had a lot of fun so far just trying to figure out how to make technology work. We're not 21st century people. That's why we do what we do. <clears throat> All right. Looks like everybody's starting to figure it out. So um, I'm Nathan Logston. This is 20th Century Adventures. Uh, this is my friend Josh Wilson. And uh, he was gracious enough to grant us uh, space in his house with his high-speed internet because I live in the middle of nowhere without high-speed internet. So that's why this is the first time we're doing a live chat like this. So um, this is going to be pretty laid back. Uh, we want to hear your questions. Um, we've had a lot of people asking on the um, on the videos that I post, uh, what do I need to do to do this? Um, where do I find the stuff? Where do, how do I do this or that? And uh, I just felt like it was a good opportunity to say, uh, let's open up the floor and hear your questions in real time and we will do our best to answer them. And if we don't know the answer, we'll make up something that sounds good. So anyway, grab your favorite beverage and uh, kick back and uh, let's see what you guys have to say. Uh, Josh and I were talking a little bit about this before we got started, uh, back when we first decided to do this about, I don't know, two weeks ago or so. Um, and we weren't sure that it was really going to go off. That's why we didn't warn you guys ahead of time. I'm sorry. We should have uh, given you a little more time to prepare and be ready for this. But uh, we're not prepared either. So. <laughs> yeah, we weather got us. <laughs> yeah, a, yeah. A whole bunch of other yeah, This was things. supposed to go off last weekend. And, uh, and and weather got in the way. And and so we decided it was best just not to say anything until we were really sure we could do this. <laughs> and even then, we had problems. <laughs> so um, so anyway, uh, let's see. who's Who's in here? Now we've got um, Cowboy Garage, Kevin Smith, Marshall Hannigan, Sarge Vining. Good to see you guys. Um, if I missed anybody, uh, I'm sorry. I, uh, it shows me numbers, but it doesn't show me necessarily everybody who's in here. So, um, so speak up if you want uh, us to recognize you. We'll we'll do our best. Um, but we were talking about some of the the things that we would like to discuss here. Um, and one of the things that popped into my mind was, uh, and, and Josh, I'll, I'll pose this to you, okay. and then um, I have my thoughts as well, but uh, what is one thing that doesn't cost a lot of money or any money? What's, what's the cheapest thing that a reenactor can do to upgrade their impression? <clears throat> I think it all boils down to your initial research mm -hmm. or what you what you would call your initial research phase. There's a lot of people who jump into the hobby and, you know, you kind of buy the first thing you see for sale. And, um, you know, it looks fun. Those guys over there are having fun, uh, you know, at the park. So you talk to them, you, you jump in, you buy the first things you see for sale. And then later on, you get some buyer's remorse. Um, or you realize that what you bought wasn't exactly what you needed for that. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, you know, whenever that sort of awakening is of this is, this is research. This is how I research. This is where I research. When you hit that initial research phase, like that launch. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not like you have to be a, college professor to do this. Right. Uh, I mean, right. you know, we have the advantage over other time periods. Uh, if you're doing late 19th or early 20th century reenacting, um, you have this plethora of photographs and uh, even videos uh, 
of the period. You know, if, if you're trying to do, um, say, you know, fifth century Byzantine, uh, you're really limited to some pretty poor quality <laughs> art, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. that uh, that gives you some idea maybe of what you're trying to present. But uh, a lot of it is is difficult to come by and, and conjecture. Whereas with late 19th and early 20th century, uh, we have a situation where um, we have this this footage, we have these photographs, and uh, there's books. I, Josh, you want to hand me one of those sure, over there? Sure. Um, just this is something that you can find uh, on Amazon or wherever. Uh, there are a bunch of these. They reprinted a lot of these uh, Sears and Roebuck catalogs, and there's other ones out there. Uh, we've also got a Montgomery Ward catalog here. Um, yeah. Um, hold that a little closer so they can see that clearly. Yeah. So that's that's the Montgomery Ward catalog. This is the Sears catalog. And uh, this one in particular is 1894. Um, but I've seen, I think it's what, 1870s to 1920s or so, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, so these are out there. And, um, you know, there, there's just pages and pages of stuff. And some of it, you know, is, is like the, the buggies I just showed probably isn't going to be of much <laughs> use. Um, but, uh, and unfortunately, they didn't really put all the clothing in these the um yeah some some have uh more things in them than others yeah um you know there's there's clothing here in right the, uh, yeah. Montgomery rewards um but when when you hit that initial research phase wherever that comes you know in your reenacting journey one of the best things you can do and you'll you'll feel your eyes starting to develop you'll be able to look at photos at, at period images, you know, whether they're engravings or, or what have you, and be able to start picking up, oh, that's 1880, that's 1890, that's 1915. And just practicing developing your eye, looking at photographs that have known dates associated with them, and then look at photographs that are undated and see if, if you're training your eye to be able to identify like, Ooh, I've been looking at a lot of 1880s photos lately, and that doesn't look like what I've been looking at. Could this be earlier or later? And having fun learning to train your eye like that is something that really just will help you when it comes to future purchases with right. your kit. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. Um, so research is cheap. It's even free because we have the advantage of the internet and Google and uh, there's a lot of books, uh, almost all of the, well, they're not all, but there are a lot of really good books that are in public domain uh, that have been digitized and are available on Google Books. Um, or you can buy print copies from Amazon. Uh, Dover Publications has reprinted tons of great books. Uh, so look those up. Um, and so you can buy these books pretty cheap. Some of them you know, you might find, find a used copy for a couple bucks, or you might uh, pay new prices. And I, I don't know what the the new price on the Sears catalog. Well, it doesn't say usually. Oh yeah, it does. Uh, Twelve ninety five. So I mean, that's a lot of data for pretty cheap. Um, but you don't even have to spend money um, if you get online, uh, search up uh, archival photographs. Uh, there's a website called archive.org, and uh, on that website, there's a lot of uh, everything. I mean, it's, there's video, there's audio, there's, um, uh, text. There's a lot of research there and it's all dated. It's all, you know, they have specific information with that, that shows the dates for those items. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, there's a lot that you can do there with, uh, uh, free resources. Um, Interlibrary loan. Interlibrary loan. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Um, a lot of times people will ask about clothing, like how, how can you tell, you know, if, if something that I'm looking at from a website is a period correct pattern and there are a lot of tailors books and you might not be interested in learning how to make your own clothing, but if you do an interlibrary loan for some of these tailoring manuals and just look at the basic shapes that are drawn in the books, that'll really help you translate that to what you're seeing 
offered for sale. Right. And that's kind of a, a next level thing. If we're talking to, you know, new reenactors, people who are interested in getting involved, but haven't done it before. Um, that may seem daunting when you start looking at Taylor's manuals, they, they are very confusing to someone who hasn't experienced them before. Um, so don't be discouraged if you crack one of those open and say, Oh my gosh, this is way beyond me. Yeah. It's, it's way beyond some of us too. Yeah. Sort of thing. yeah. But don't, don't be afraid to, you know, like I say, even, even if you'll never do that, check it out from the library, get it on interlibrary loan and mm-hmm. flip through it, you know, see, see what you can glean from that. Yeah. There's a lot of, of just little side points in there that you might pick up on. Um, yeah, I, I can't, unfortunately can't remember which book it was, but there was one that I looked at that, uh, had a whole section on uh, where and how and under what circumstances gentlemen should wear their watches. Um, and so, you know, it was whether you should have a chain across or whether it should be a single fob hanging out or, you know, what. And there's uh, certain situations uh, where you would wear one or the other. Um, and I never thought of that. Uh, and I wish I could remember which book that was because that was really interesting. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, get in there and and just start reading. That's really the easiest way. Another thing that any reenactor can do uh, that will significantly improve the look of their impression. If this is somebody who's already got some basic kit and they're doing things, um, we all go out and we camp and we have to eat. Um, and a lot of us have a cooler that we throw a blanket over and you pull out the plastic package and you very discreetly open it and and put your stuff out. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes for me in the kitchen to repackage my food. And with things like cheese or bacon, uh, I'll package it as if it came straight from the grocer. Uh, in that period. So it's just simply a piece of wax paper or a piece of parchment paper and you wrap it up. Uh, that's all you have to do. Throw a piece of string around it. That's all it is. Um, if you want to get more involved, uh, let's say you have a can of tomatoes. Um, get online, look at Google. Uh, actually, my website, I have a, a free document you can download for free that has uh, labels in it that you can print off that are already scaled to size. Um, but relabel your modern cans with a period label, and then you don't have to worry about hiding it. You just set it out there on your table. It's a prop until the point you crack it open with your period can opener that you bought off eBay. You know, that kind of stuff just ticks it up a notch, and it really doesn't cost anything more than printer ink and paper. We got some questions coming in. It seems like there's a, a lot of chatting there. Um, yeah, I see a lot of things going on. Uh, there was a company that reprinted a number of Abercrombie, Abercrombie Fish. Fish. Oh, very cool. Yes. Yes. Uh, shoot. I, I, I just ordered some things from them. They are still in business. They are still printing those catalogs. I just ordered a few. Um, I cannot for the life of me remember the name of the company. I'm sorry. This is the problem when we do live things <laughs> is we don't have the chance to sit there and, and check our, our work. Um, but yes, if you, if you Google, uh, Abercrombie and Fitch reprint catalogs, you will find the company. And it's not just Abercrombie and Fitch. They have, oh my gosh, tons and tons. I think they primarily print them for gun collectors uh, because most of the catalogs are gun related. Uh, but all of them, or most of them, have other sporting goods in the catalogs. And, uh, and, and they span, I don't know, from early 1900s up to the 1950s or 60s, I think. Um, and uh, there's a ton of those out there. And those are extremely valuable resources. I love sitting in, I'll, in the wintertime. I'll sit in my chair next to the wood stove and just pour through those catalogs and wish I could order everything. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Oh, Kevin Smith, sorry to see you go. Uh, uh, Glad you got to spend a little bit of time with us. Um, from French Lick. Hey, that's just up the road from where I live. That's wonderful. Uh, glad to see you in here. Uh, here we go. What type of organized events exist in your craft? Uh, I'm a Rocky Mountain fur trade guy, and I enjoy our rendezvous, uh, but I've never heard of anything in your time frame 
and you have my interest for sure. Wonderful. Actually, believe it or not, and I think Josh might have a similar background, um, but I started out in uh, the pre-1840 rendezvous world. Um, that was that and, and Renaissance fairs, believe it or not. Um, so, uh, so I know where you're coming from and, uh, and this is actually a fantastic crossover. Um, the reason being that there's a lot of things, uh, that are commonly accepted in the pre-1840 fur trade rendezvous world, uh, that aren't really correct to that period. Um, you know, some of the things that come to mind are like, uh, the dire moccasins. Um, they're wonderful. Wonderful moccasins. I can't say enough good things about them, uh, but they are not pre-1840. Uh, in fact, they come, uh, the earliest I have found significant documentation for that style of moccasin uh, is in a, um, I think it was a uh, fur trapper magazine from 1890 something, um, where they have a pattern in there and show you uh, how, to, how to cut out and make those kind of moccasins. And that's the earliest I've ever seen it. Uh, so actually those moccasins are more appropriate to this period than they are to what they're primarily marketed for being you know, the 1840 fur trade. They're not right for that, but they're very right for uh, doing a, a 1900s to, to 1920 woodsman. Um, and, uh, and of course the uh, speckled enamel wear, the blue, enamel wear with the white dots uh, did not exist until after the Civil War, um, but they're prolific in the rendezvous crowd, but they're not really right. Uh, but they are completely correct for our period. So you probably have uh, a lot of stuff that you can use right now. Um, the, the difference is you're going to have to get some different clothes and things like that. Uh, clothing largely was off the rack uh, by the mid teens. Um, and so, uh, you wouldn't see much in the way of leather clothing, uh, like, like we're used to seeing in that, that genre. Uh, but you would definitely see lots of, of, um, hunting jackets and, uh, the breeches and, uh, brush pants, things like that. If you're a woodsman, uh, you probably have a hunting vest of some sort. Um, and, uh, and, and mix that in with the stuff that exists that you can already use from your other period. Um, now, as far as events, uh, sorry, Josh, I need to cut you off. Oh, <laughs> you're fine. As far as events, there's a few things, um, that are kind of up and coming and some that have been existing for a while. Um, the old car festival at Greenfield village at the Henry Ford, um, they have been really working towards, um, creating more of a, um, uh, atmosphere, I guess is what I'm going for. It used to be just an old car show, pre-war car show. And now, um, they're starting to encourage more period clothing and camping and so on and so forth. Um, I host a maple sugaring camp in February every year at my place. Um, and then I know that, um, uh, one of our fellow YouTubers, um, Sean, uh, Dyer. Dyer, thank you. <laughs> uh, Sean Dyer is putting on a squirrel camp in uh, October. I think it's the 25th or something of October. Um, and uh, that's going to be a big thing. I think uh, he, he's trying to get as many people in this period that want to come to show up for that. Uh, so if you're anywhere near Ohio, that's a good thing to go to. Um, there's uh, also stuff going on at the... Um, Sergeant York Museum in Tennessee. Uh, they've got a lot of cool things going on. They've been doing, uh, of course, they do World War One events, but they also have been working on doing some more civilian uh, interpretations as well. And uh, and I think they've got something in the works that will be strictly civilian. Um, and there's a lot of other smaller events going on around the area. Uh, hopefully, that will um, begin to grow. Uh, uh, Sarge Vining actually puts on a big one. Uh, down in Texas as well. That's uh, and that that is one that I really want to get to because um, they uh, they have airplanes and cars and all kinds of great stuff there. So yeah, it, it looks was, looks like Sarge has shared uh, some information there on other events. Oh, great! Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. 
and it, it's really fun. Oh, and Cradle of Forestry. Yeah, they're they're doing stuff. Uh, that's one I want to get down to as well. It, it's really fun. Nathan and I bookend 1900. Um, some of the pre-1900 things that I've done have been like uh, Wild West, Old West sort of events. Um, it's harder to find on this side of the Mississippi. There's one at um, Old Bedford Village in Pennsylvania that uh, that's that's a fairly big to do. Um, then, of course, you know, if you're west of the Mississippi, um, you know, the, all the big places um, like Lincoln, New Mexico, Tombstone, they, they tend to have, you know, the, the old west sort of things that fits in that like 1880s to 1890 um, sort of era that I'm into. Um, so, yeah, there's there's several things like that, too, you can <clears throat> and, and look into and find. There's a lot of small things going on, which I personally enjoy because it's not as um, intensive for me as an interpreter uh, that I, I don't spend quite as much time talking and I need to have some fun too. Um, but I'll tell you another one that I really enjoy and I don't miss it because I'm only 35 minutes away. Um, but in September, I think around the second weekend of September, you'd have to look at their website, French Lick uh, and West Baden Resorts uh, in French Lick, Indiana. They put on a vintage weekend uh, in September, and it is fantastic. Um, of course, the the site there is incredible. It's, if you want to experience uh, stepping back in time, uh, especially West Baden. French Lake is impressive. West Baden is extremely impressive, and they're side by side. You can you can actually ride an original trolley car uh, back and forth between the two resorts. These were original resorts that were built uh, towards the end of the 19th century and um, and were reached their heyday in the, the aughts and teens um, and uh, kind of suffered after the Great Depression. Uh, but those sites are amazing. And during their vintage weekend, they also have a uh, vintage baseball world series. So if you're into sports, especially the history of sports, uh, that's a great thing. You'll see, you know, antique cars, um, Enjoy the, the resorts, ride the trolley, and watch some vintage baseball. It's really amazing. They have a brass band. Uh, it's just unbelievably great. So uh, if you're anywhere in the area of French Lake, Indiana, definitely check that out as well. Uh, September 13th through 18th is their 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 weekend. Um, so thank you, Naomi. It's Josh's wife is behind the scenes <laughs> helping us out, keeping us on track. Uh, okay, we got some other questions here. Um, Let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah, lots of good stuff. What are you drinking? <laughs> well, uh, we are uh, mostly drinking water with a little bit of bourbon in it, uh, just to, to keep the juices flowing. Um, what was that? Above. Was there one above that we missed? Uh, May the 4th at Kingsbury Pioneer Flight Museum. Uh, oh, uh, great to oh. catch live. I'm a 1915 to 1930-ish re reenactor. Didn't realize others were doing this until recently. Thanks for your efforts. Well, we're glad to have you, and uh, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, there's there's a growing uh, community of, of people interested in this period. I think it's probably one of the fastest growing genres of living history right now. Um, we're, we're in that happy spot where we're uh, just over 100 years on, on part of it and, uh, and some things just reaching 100 years. So uh, that's kind of the, the sweet spot where reenacting in a period really takes off. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we've been trying to foster this uh, myself and, uh, uh, of course, Josh and uh, Sarge Vining, if you're not subscribed to his channel, uh, I recommend that. Um, Sarge, if you would drop your link to your uh, channel, that'd be great. That way people can see it and sign up for it. Um, also, uh, uh, Sean Dyer, uh, uh, Honorable Mr. Dyer's... The Musings of Honorable Musables, Mr. Musings, Mr. Dyer. Yeah. Musings of Honorable Mr. Dyer. Uh, he is fantastic. He really gets into some neat stuff. If you're interested in um, really the, the camping survival aspect, uh, he really gets into that a lot. Um, 
and uh, and Sarge has a lot of good in-depth history. You'll get into uh, projects and uh, the the history of things and and what's right to wear and what type. He does a lot of the work for you. If you if you are not good at research, he does a lot of that for you, and he's very good at what he does. I, I highly recommend him. Uh, so so definitely jump on board both of those guys' channels uh, when you get a chance. Um, and of course, follow 20th Century Adventures because that's pretty much all I do. Um, Cape Heart Days. Cape Heart Days, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've got a friend that likes to go to that one. Yeah, he yeah. He speaks very highly of that. Yeah, event. we've heard good things about that, and that's one that I want to get to. Lately, it's been hard for me to get out and travel too much. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll get to do more of that uh, real soon. Oh, yeah. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Brian just mentioned uh, South Park City in Colorado. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's a cool spot. If if you haven't um, if you haven't checked out Victorian Bar Room, I highly recommend that. Um, so uh, Brian Cushing is a uh, master mixologist and also a uh, a distiller, among other things, a uh, home brewer, and um, also one of our very best friends. And uh, he has a channel called the Victorian Bar Room where they cook up cocktails uh, from the Victorian period. And it is very interesting. Uh, it's very informative. And uh, sometimes he gets off into uh, other historical things that are really cool. And he did a whole series on uh, South Park City in Colorado. And uh, so you can see some of the things there on his channel. Um, some of the things they have at South Park City is totally worth checking out for sure. Uh, oh, Brian also mentioned rolling into the vintage baseball game with the Model T. Uh, <laughs> it was really cool. Yes, that was really cool. That was a lot of fun. We did last year, we did our national uh, motor camp which we're going to try to do every two years. Um, the next one is going to be in California. Uh, so you West Coasters, uh, that's that's gonna be a good one for you. I don't have exact dates and locations just yet, um, but there is going to be another National Motor Camp and it will be in California uh, in, in 2025. Um, so we're gonna do it every two years is, is the plan with that. And I'm, I'm, I organized the first one and I'm kind of stepping back and I'm just gonna assist. For a while and then i may put on another one in a few years but it's too big of a job to to do uh one person by themselves over and over so that's why we're doing what we're doing so um but we did our our first national motor camp in indiana and uh we took a motor camp tour up to uh well among other places we we went to french lake and west baden during their uh vintage weekend and you can see that video on my channel as well uh where it says national motor camp uh Camping and vintage baseball. And I, I want to give a shout out here to Dave Westcott. Um, Dave uh, very generously offered to share his resources. Dave's been at it for a while. Um, I, and this is the first time really I think I've connected with Dave, but we have a mutual friend, <laughs> Steve Watts. Um, I used to talk to Steve about this quite a bit. I actually knew Steve. Um, Steve was a good guy. Yeah, I, I knew Steve. I met him when I was nine or 10. Maybe I'm mean, I mean, quite a while ago doing um, primitive technology things. And uh, when Steve got into this, I used to have good, good chats with him on that, too. And uh, so, yeah, we, we definitely appreciate being able to connect with you. And, uh, you know, sharing resources would definitely be fun. Definitely be right up there. Something I want to do. <clears throat> Brian says, very flattered. Miss you guys. Yeah, Brian, you should be here with us right now. You could be a part of this. I don't know. We got to get you out of the house, man. <laughs> or out of the office, I guess it is. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so uh, let's see. What else have we got to, to convey? Do we have any other oh, great man. knowledge that we'd like to share? I don't know. <laughs> I, I put him on the spot because I didn't want to be on the spot. <laughs> First to the draw there. Uh, how do you get into 20th century theme? Um, 
not sure I know what you're asking there, but I'm I'm going to um, uh, assume you mean how do you get into the the hobby or um, uh, maybe expound on that a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, so sorry to mention this persona. Um, so getting into the hobby, uh, a lot of it is just simply doing it. Um, you know, put together some clothes and uh, the, the easiest way to start actually doing some stuff is uh, get on the Model T Ford Club of America website and find your local Model T Ford Club of America chapter and find their contact person. There's, there's a chapter in every state. Um, and this is all people who own Model Ts. Now, they're not necessarily reenactors, but they have cars from our period. Uh, and they also are extremely friendly and very happy to have people that are interested in what they're interested in. Um, so of, of all the antique car people, I've been into antique cars since I was a kid. Of all the antique car people that I've ever met, the Model Tiers are the most friendly and welcoming, and they don't care. They don't. If I've I've driven Model T tours in a Studebaker, and they didn't care. Um, <laughs> so uh, they're really nice people. And if you contact your local Model T chapter, uh, find out when their tours are, they'll probably offer you a ride, or you can ask, uh, say, "Hey, do you have an extra, extra seat?" And then you put your clothes on and you go ride in the Model T for a day, and you have a lot of fun. Um, that's a great way to get started. Um, also, you can go to any of the events that we've mentioned in this uh, uh, live stream, and you can meet other people that way. I also recommend getting on Facebook, if you're attached to Facebook, um, get on the Amalgamated Order of Motor Campers group, uh, the 20th Century Sportsman group. Uh, there's a Bannerman's Camp group and uh, Antique Automobile Camping Collective. Those are all groups that cater entirely to recreating this period. Um, and so those are all wonderful groups to get involved in. You'll meet other people that are into the same sort of thing that you're into. Um, if you're looking for uh, gear and clothing to purchase, uh, some of those groups will have uh, resources as well. Um, and then, of course, uh, there's my own website, uh, logstonandco.com. Uh, I also highly recommend um, uh, What Price Glory. Uh, they mainly are a military outfitter, uh, but they do carry some civilian things. And uh, for camping-related purposes, Military Surplus was and still is very popular for camping gear. Uh, and Prior to World War I, uh, a lot of, pretty much all of the American surplus was liquidated. Um, so you can use, for let's say 1905 to 1916, um, you can use Civil War and Spanish-American War objects. Make sure that it makes sense. Obviously, you wouldn't go camping in a Civil War uniform. Um, but you might carry a Civil War canteen. Um, I have documentation for the Civil War era gum blankets being used in 1923 uh, as a motor camping tarp. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that carries over. Um, Spanish American War stuff was surplused, I think, in 1916 uh, as they made way for all the new stuff. And, um, and then Following World War One, a lot of stuff was was surplused right off the bat. Uh, some things wait a little longer, but by 1927, uh, pretty much any piece that was used by American GIs in World War One was available to the public at that time. Um, Sarge Vining has a whole video on this, so uh, check out his video on surplus. Um, so. Back to it, uh, what, what Price Glory carries a lot of, uh, they do carry some Spanish American War stuff, they carry World War One stuff, uh, and they carry some civilian stuff. So I, I highly recommend them. Uh, their stuff is great. Um, there's also a, um, a Chinese company called Bronson. Uh, they mainly focus on workwear. Now, not everything on their website is correct. 
uh, you do need to use some discretion in that. Um, but they're, they have like a 1920s uh, railway Wabash stripe pants that are spot on. Um, and some of their caps and stuff are great. Um, if you have a, a little more of a budget and you want some really nice stuff, uh, the Chris LaRose Hat Company does fantastic hats and jackets. And uh, he's, I think he's got some shirts in the works. Uh, he does wonderful work. It's all made in the USA. It is top-notch stuff. Uh, it's a little pricey, but it is worth it. Uh, I have one of his hats and it's just wonderful. So it looks like Marshall is asking um, what drew ourselves to this period. Uh, for for me, I've always just been in the Victor into the Victorian era. Um, the style of the clothing, the aesthetics of all the material goods, all the history that was going on, especially here in America. Um, you know, we've all got that fascination with, you know, Jesse James and Wyatt Earp. Um, all, all of the history and things that were going on here, all the inventions, so many things uh, were patented and invented between 1875 and 1900. <clears throat> it's just a super fascinating time for me, and I've, I've just always been into it. And uh, at one point I thought, well, you know, I'd like to reenact that. Um, yeah, I started off doing 18th century, and I thought I'd like to reenact the late Victorian era. And... Uh, then at some point, I was like, nobody else is doing it. And so I decided um, I'm just going to go ahead and, and drop the hammer on this. And if I'm sitting in the woods by myself dressed in, in 1880s clothing, then then so be it. Yeah. And the thing is, if you start doing it, other people will do it with you. Yes. yes. <laughs> or you'll find other people, um, you know, like our, our comment up above about the guy that was 1915 to 1930s. Mm -hmm. You'll find out other people are also interested in doing it. Right. And, um, you know, you, you can start a group, join a group, you know, get a couple buddies together. Sometimes it's, that's all it takes. Uh, but it, it was just sort of a combination of everything in daily life um, that drew me to it. Um, what, what for me, I'm, I've been a reenactor uh, for 25 years um, uh, of all different time periods. You name it, I've probably done something at least pretty close to it. Um, and... For the majority of that time, I was doing military. Uh, I've done Civil War military and Revolutionary War military and uh, French Indian War military. And most uh, most of the time, I did a lot of 1812 military. And I, uh, all through the bicentennial of 1812, um, I was commanding troops and going out on the battlefield. And after a while, uh, it started to wear on me. And I thought, you know, I, I, I don't really want to play war anymore. This is, this is, I had some experiences that were immersive enough to the point that I said, I don't think I like this anymore. Um, and, uh, and I, I, I still get some excitement out of experiences like that. But, uh, but what I found was that I really enjoyed the camp life and the peace of the forest and when I do early 20th century, uh, I don't have to pretend anything. Uh, I don't have to pretend that I'm at war or that the soldier across the way there is going to kill me um, when actually he's one of my buddies and uh, he was on my side last weekend. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not knocking that part of reenacting because I know that that's a cool part and I've done that for many, many years. Um, but I eventually reached the point where I thought, hmm, I really like the reality and the immersive experience uh, without having to fake anything uh, because I'm really going camping and that's really what they did. Uh, you know, this was the golden age of camping and hunting and sporting for fun, uh, you know, up until the Civil War, uh, we hunted for food. Uh, you know, in, in Europe, they hunted for sport. Uh, but in America, we hunted for food, rarely for sport. And, uh, and it wasn't until the late 19th century uh, that we began to hunt really for sport. And the period from 
1890 to about 1930 is kind of the golden age of that sport hunting. And I do enjoy hunting. I, it's something that, uh, that I like to do, uh, because I like to be in the woods. I like to have that, uh, that quiet time in the woods. And so for me, a lot of my reenacting is solo. Uh, I go out, you know, and I walk through the woods with period gear or I hunt with period gear. I hunt exclusively in historical clothing with historical gear. Uh, if it's um, normal gun season, I'm, I'm doing 20th century. And if it's muzzleloader season, I'm doing 18th century. But, uh, but I, I enjoy hunting with historical gear and historical clothing. Uh, it kind of adds to the challenge some, and, uh, and it also gives me something to, to enjoy and focus on uh, when, when the game is slow and slow, and there's not much going on. So uh, for me, it's about taking my living history to another level and making it more real for me, uh, because I really am hunting, and I really am camping, and I really am fishing, uh, and I'm not just playing pretend. I'm, I'm not here doing it. So that's what that's that's what draws me to this period. Uh, that and the cars. I love cars. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's watched my channel knows I love cars. Um, what else we got? Unique in that it's reenacting leisure. Yeah, it, it yeah, really is. It, it, yeah, yeah. reenacting leisure. That's great. Um, yes, yeah, Dar uh, Drew mentioned Darcy. Uh, Darcy of England uh, is the company. And uh, they, not everything is spot on, um, but they do a pretty good job. Uh, I love their collars. Um, I'm not wearing one right now, but I'll be wearing one later on this weekend when we film a video that will air in a few weeks. Um, but uh, Darcy detachable collars are fantastic. I know Brian Cushing really likes their shirts too. Um, so uh, definitely, uh, now of course you, you're buying from England, so the shipping's high, but it's worth it. It's good stuff. Yes, I, I love the equipment. Um, definitely the equipment from this period is a fun one. Um, you know, and as far as crafting goes, uh, you know, in 18th century, there's there's this push to like, let's do this by hand. Let's sew this by hand. But in this time period, you get sewing machines. It's, right. It's, it's so much nicer. <laughs> Brian is trolling us. I thought that was a real comment until I realized who it was from. Uh, <laughs> chances are slim to none that you'll get anything if you're not wearing Moscow. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> um, if you watch my uh, 1915 deer camp video, uh, while I did not get a deer in that video, unfortunately, I, I let one walk because I wanted a bigger one that was behind him. And that is the biggest downfall of all hunters is letting one walk because there's a better one behind him and the better one never comes out. And that's what happened in that video. But at the end of the video, I do show pictures from past hunts where I am wearing period clothes and Buffalo check and have a deer in front of me. You can totally kill deer in things other than mossy oak. So our grandfathers did it. In fact, they almost wiped the deer population off the face of the earth. Uh, so if they can do it, we can do it. <laughs> but thanks for trolling me, Brian. Um, Sarge says we can actually walk the, exactly the same ground, doing exactly the same things in exactly the same way. Precisely. Yes. Precisely. Well spoken. Thank you. Um, Neither neither one of us have very good eyesight. We yeah, sorry. Of, we're yeah. just we're trying really hard to read this stuff, and and uh, and and Naomi's telling us that we missed a few. Um, uh, oh, so as go far ahead. as personas go, um, I I don't really pick a persona, but I, I'll sometimes sort of pick an occupation, um, like Nathan's uh, hunting camp video. Uh, you know, for that weekend, I was the camp cook and, you know, day to day life, you know, in 2024, I enjoy cooking. And so when I go to events, I, I enjoy cooking. Um, and if, if we're doing private events, it really just feels, you know, reenacting leisure. Um, what, what do I feel like doing that's 
that's contributing, but also I feel is, is leisurely for me this weekend. Um, for events that are public, then it really sort of just depends on the event itself. If somebody else needs me to fill in a role, then I, I kind of pick up a persona, um, you know, whatever they need me to do at the moment. I don't really have, you know, a persona as such. You know, there's some guys uh, that, you know, they're, they're a lawman every weekend or they're a cowboy every weekend, and, and that's fine. Um, but I, I have trouble getting excited about being locked down uh, my, we did go through a phase uh, with the 20th Century Sportsman back when we first got that group going uh, with some of the original members uh, where we all created kind of a backstory of we're here on the weekend to camp, make maple syrup, go hunting, whatever, go fishing. Um, but what do we do in the real life? Because we're obviously now having a vacation. Um, so uh, we went through... Uh, picking things. And, and for me, it was um, that I owned a gas station and, uh, and operated a, a mechanic shop because I, I know how to do those sorts of things. And, um, and, and it gave me a good excuse to have a car there too. Um, and another fella uh, was really interested in uh, the history of the mail service um, because his grandfather was a postman. And so he kind of adopted that persona and uh, another fellow said, well, I, I, I'm a butcher back home. And, uh, and some people just drew off of their, their own uh, professions um, and just put it into a period context. And that's a great way if you want to kind of give yourself some guidance and say, okay, <clears throat> what kind of things might I have um, being this sort of person, as opposed to being this sort of person, you know, and, and you might decide that, oh, I really like um, fine hunting rifles that are are almost presentation pieces, and that's what I collect. Um, and so I'm going to create my persona around a wealthy gentleman who is, uh, you know, taking a moment away from Wall Street. Um, and so you would have the latest equipment from the Abercrombie and Fitch catalog, or you might have custom made clothing even uh, that was very expensive and you'd have all the best leather gear uh, for your hunting equipment. And you may even have an assistant. Um, on the other hand, if you're a gas station mechanic like me, um, you might actually go out uh, to a camp and show up in your, uh, coveralls or, uh, you know, I would often wear a, a wool shirt that had a golf emblem on the chest um, to show that I had just come from work. Um, you know, the, the little things. Um, you don't have to create a backstory, but when you do, it kind of immerses you a little bit more and, and gives you more of that uh, I'm in the moment experience. What else? Uh, there was something I wanted to, that somebody had said, and I, I went back to to look at it. And oh, um, there it is. Broken Barbox said, Waypoint Survival has been doing a series of videos focusing on 1930s hobos. Yes, I have really enjoyed those videos. Um, kudos to Waypoint Survival on, on that. I actually would love to sit around the campfire with you sometime, if you ever happen to see this. Um, because I think, uh, I think we have a lot of talk to talk about. Uh, I really enjoy those videos. And so definitely uh, check out Waypoint Survival as well. Uh, he's doing some cool stuff. Um, let's see. Uh, Reno Gang, first train robbery, Southern Indiana. I did not know that. Yes. That's yes. interesting. Um, everybody wants to, to talk about Jesse James, but it was actually the Reno Gang. And... Um, I'm trying to remember the whole story now, but it was in Southern Indiana and then somebody else copycatted them and they got mad and went after the other gang that copycatted them. It's, <laughs> it's a, it's a story that's very worth looking up. Nice. Nice. Timber drifters says the guns are much better <laughs> to some extent. Yes. I, I, I do have a partiality to an old flintlock rock, rock crusher. Um, I do enjoy those, but, um, but yes, 
I just recently acquired a Remington Model 8, and oh my gosh, I love it. Are you finding it more difficult to locate original equipment? Actually, for, for this time period, depending on what you're looking for, um, you can find stuff at antique stores all day long. You can. Um, however, a lot of the things that are most desirable in our aspect uh, have have significantly gone up. When I first started doing this about uh, 10 years ago, maybe, um, I used to buy uh, 1920s gasoline stoves for 30 bucks. And now you're looking at $100 for one that doesn't work. Um, now, the cool thing is all of that stuff can be rebuilt. There's hardly anything from that period that can't be rebuilt. Um, and there are places to get new O-rings and uh, the leather washers and stuff for the gasoline lanterns. Um, you can find that stuff. So uh, it is doable. There's lots of videos on YouTube how to uh, rebuild Coleman lanterns and camp cook, cook stoves and all that stuff. Um, so definitely uh, and those things actually benefit from being used. Um, so the, the, the gasoline lanterns, kerosene lanterns, um, the uh, gasoline cook stoves and antique automobiles need to be used. It gets the oil all through the system. It gets the, the lubrication in the places it needs to be, and it keeps the tubes clean and all that. Those things should be used, uh, and you're not going to hurt them by using them. Um, on the other hand, with clothing and leather gear, uh, I really want to stress that we don't want to use that stuff in the field. Um, and and I've, I've done it. I, I, I've worn the original stuff because nothing else was available. And that's why I started producing. I, I didn't want to make this a business, but I opened my website because I had done it in the past. I knew how to get this stuff made. And I saw there was a need for the, the stuff that would be damaged by using the original gear. Um, and so I've tried to reproduce the stuff that would be damaged, uh, shirts and, and boots and things like that. Um, so I, I would encourage you not to use leather or fabric items that are original um, because they'll they'll get used up. Uh, they, they're fragile, they'll get worn out. Um, this happened uh, in the 1960s uh, during the centennial of the American Civil War. Um, this stuff was 100 years old and you could buy Civil War gear at any antique store across the nation. And a lot of times it was cheap. Uh, everybody had something from their grandfather in the attic. And that stuff was, was prolific and people bought it and they used it for reenacting and it got used up. And uh, there's a lot of things that were lost because of that. Um, and we don't wanna repeat that mistake. But so. Yeah, sorry. But but there's other things, you know, like like personal camp gear, you know, your lanterns, mm -hmm. um, you can find those. Sometimes you can find them at yeah, better deals than others. Um, you know, cookware, plates, cups, forks, you can find that stuff real cheap, real prolifically. Right. And a lot of it, too, really depends on your location. Uh, we have a friend who got super excited. He lives on the West Coast. He found a carbide lamp for $65. Um, that was the first one he'd ever seen on the West Coast. He thought 65 bucks was a good deal because it's the only one I've ever seen. It seems like the going price. But where I'm from in West the, Virginia, yeah, those are prolific. I can pick them up, you know, 25 to 35 bucks all day long. And I, you know, I said, hold on, don't don't get that. I'll, I'll find you one and mail <laughs> it to you, you know, for half the price. Um, so it really depends too on your location. And that's where the the Facebook groups and networking with other people that do this sort of thing is valuable uh, because we're all in it for the same thing. We're here to have fun and we will totally pick up something and send it to you. Uh, you know, it's, it's what we do. It's, it's all about pro proliferating the hobby and getting more people doing what we like to do. Let's see, let's <laughs> got a bunch <laughs> of new ones. Squint here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where do you find period fishing equipment? Okay. This has been, a real bugaboo for me because I cannot find good reproduction stuff anywhere. There's the, the few things that are being reproduced are junk. 
Um, so, <laughs> however, uh, fishing poles, as long as you don't snap them over your knee or stick them in the ceiling fan, uh, yes, I've done that, <laughs> um, you're generally not going to break them. And they will last forever. And you can find them at antique stores dirt cheap. I've found them as cheap as 10 bucks for a, a 19 teens fishing pole. Uh, same way with reels. You can find the reels depending on what they are. Some of them are very collectible and are worth a ton of money. Um, but the average run of the mill ones that everybody had, which is actually the most historically appropriate thing to carry, um, are a dime a dozen. The collectors don't want them. And uh, you can pick them up for 15 or 20 bucks at an antique store. Same thing with fishing lures. Yeah. Um, and with some, with some lures, them, you don't want to fish with an antique lure. Yes. Um, yes. But uh, there's a fellow named Jeffrey Green in Tennessee. Uh, he makes reproduction lures, does a fantastic job of doing that. Uh, and I've made some myself. They're not hard to make uh, if you've got a little bit of artistic talent. Um, if, if you're interested in uh, like miniatures or model airplanes or anything like that, then you are totally the right person to make reproduction lures. Uh, because it's kind of the same sort of thing. You just carve them out of a piece of wood, whittle them out, put a little lead weight in the bottom, add your hooks, paint them to look attractive to a fish. Yeah, and you can find those at antique stores and, you know, get get one, take your measurements off of it. Get ideas, yeah. yeah. And there's, there's tons of books. There's tons of information online. Uh, there's actually a wonderful PDF file of a, um, a fishing tackle box, copper tackle box, and you can Google it. It's online. Uh, find this PDF of of uh, the tackle box, and they they measured the box, they uh, documented every piece in there. There's wonderful photographs of every single piece that was in it. Uh, it was all pre 1930 stuff in this tackle box, and uh, and so that's a great place for ideas. Um, lots of places to find fishing ideas. Uh, you just may have to make your own um, on some of the lures and uh, and and buy. Uh, antique poles and reels. Um, learning to use them is a whole different thing. Those are really tricky to use. They, they are not like modern reels. They're more like a, a, a bait casting reel. Uh, and so I find myself, I'll, I'll play with it for about 30 minutes and I get incredibly frustrated and give up. That's why there has been no fishing video yet. Uh, yes, doesn't have to be a planned event. Don, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, like to live the tea and go to a local state park. I do too. Um, and you don't have to have a Model T to do this. Um, people are more accepting of 20th century clothing out in public than they are of, say, 18th century clothing or medieval clothing. Uh, some people kind of look at that as weird. <coughs> but um, 20th century clothing is so similar to say hipster clothing of today that people either don't notice it or they say, Hey, you look sharp. Um, and you can walk into a dozen different historic sites. In fact, Josh and I went up to a um, little ice cream parlor that's been in business since 1897, right here in his hometown. Uh, and we had milkshakes and uh, it was a great experience. And uh, you know, there's a few modern things in there. There's a cash register and stuff like that. And, and the, the staff is wearing modern clothes, but the woodwork is original and, uh, and the, the atmosphere is still cool. Um, so yeah, you can, you can have a 20th century experience anywhere. Um, just go out and do it. And, and like I said, get out in the woods. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. Uh, Victorian bar room. Uh, this is uh, Brian's wife, Amy. Uh, she says, I will say for the women, 1920s, one hour, uh, which actually means one day dress is uh, a nice intro to the period. So that's an easy thing to start with. Uh, if you need something, you know, just for you ladies uh, to get out there. Also, this is the period where, uh, and specifically in camping relation, um, where it becomes acceptable for women to wear pants um, and to wear uh, like a men's style shirt, but not shirt with pockets on the chest. Uh, all of that comes into play. Um, caps like this. Sometimes it was cut for a woman. Sometimes it was just men's clothing. Um, and I've seen women even wearing some army surplus stuff. Uh, but nine times out of 10, it's going to be a, uh, a women's cut 
in a men's style. Um, so the vest is is cut for the chest and the uh, breeches are cut for the hips, um, but it's still based off the men's clothing. And that was totally acceptable to wear in a camping situation by say 1918. Um, World War One really changed uh, the way that Americans thought about women's dress um, and the way that women thought about their dress. And, uh, and so you, you kind of have this changeover. So there's a lot of things that, that uh, women can do to get involved um, or men, you can get your spouses involved um, by either, you know, getting into something like the one hour dress uh, that is a pretty simple 1920s pattern uh, or uh, getting into some of the, uh, their clothing as well. And there's lots of patterns. There are so many patterns out there for women. It's, it's kind of depressing because there's probably eight good women's patterns for every good men's pattern for this period. But, you know, that's how it is. The women are the ones that sew most of the time, except for, you know, weirdos like us. <laughs> but one of Naomi's favorite photos is a, uh, a lady in a, uh, you can't really tell if it's a dress or a skirt. She's got a cardigan buttoned up over it. And she, her, her long arm in one hand and a, you know, a freshly harvested rabbit in the other, you know, smiling for the photo. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to, to always be breeches or men's clothing or whatever, you know, you can, can sew a, a dress and go hunting in it or, um, you know, take a car ride or go for a picnic in the park or anything. Uh, what are your favorite motor camping books for reference? Um, Okay, so um, who I really like the um, Motor Camping by Long and Long. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, the Jessup book on motor camping is very good. Um, and then there's books that are just plain entertaining uh, that also have a lot of good reference information hidden in. Uh, one that reads like a novel but is actually a firsthand account is um, motor camping on Western trails. Uh, Ferguson, Melville Ferguson wrote that one. Um, and actually I'm, I'm getting ready to turn that into an audio book. That's going to be on the channel uh, before too long because it's not available in anywhere except an original first edition printing. And I managed to get my hands on one, uh, but it's not on Google books or anything else. So um, we're trying to turn that into an audio book that you guys can listen to. Um, uh, another one that's really great is Auto Gypsies. Uh, the story behind that is a fellow bought a Model T in 2012, I think, uh, 2010 maybe. And uh, when he bought the Model T, the guy said, oh, this goes with it. And he handed him a box of letters and newspaper clippings that were uh, the, the reminiscences of this trip that was taken in that car in 1923 from Georgia to California. And, um, and so the, the fellow who bought the Model T tracked down the grandson of uh, one of the people on that trip. And uh, together they edited these letters into a, a, a book format. And that's available on Amazon as a Kindle ebook or as a print book. It's called Auto Gypsies. Um, that's a really great one too. Um, really interesting read. So there's a few books right there off the top of my head uh, that are really excellent relating to motor camping. What else we got? We're going to have to wrap this up pretty soon. We've been at it for over an hour now. <laughs> I'm losing my voice. Um, do you have any period automobile specific channels to suggest? Oh goodness. Um, there is one that I follow and I cannot remember the name of it. Um, I will add it into the uh, uh, description once I remember who it is, AKA when this is over and I look it up. Um, but uh, yeah, there, there are some good automobile channels out there. Um, uh, there's also episodes on other channels where they go into antique cars. Um, and so those are, those are good. I know Vice Grip Garage did one uh, with the Model A that was pretty good. Um, so you just uh, kind of got to look around um, I don't know that there's any other than myself that focus entirely on pre-1930 vehicles. <clears throat> but um, I think there's 
there's a lot of good stuff out there. Once you start following these other channels, um, you'll start to, to see that stuff pop up uh, as a YouTube recommendation as well. Um, but uh, also you can search for uh, the Model T Ford Club of America or Model A Ford Club of America. Those are usually uh, abbreviated uh, uh, by their acronyms. Um, so you can search those and find lots of good stuff on these cars as well. Um, so yeah. Um, anybody else have anything else at the last second here that they want to put in? Uh, Yes. Excellent show, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate your feedback. It's what keeps us doing this. We know that people are enjoying it. Uh, that they're getting something out of it. Uh, otherwise, it would be a waste of time. Um, although we do enjoy sitting here uh, creating hot air and uh, and having a slip, slip of bourbon now and then. Uh, but um, no, we, we really want this hobby to grow. Uh, we would like to see more people out here doing this sort of thing um, and, and getting involved. And uh, and I will say right off the bat that if you're ever in the Southern Indiana area, uh, shoot me a message and maybe we can uh, hook up and go for a Model T ride because I always love to take people for Model T rides. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, is this GTB81? I do actually, I have a tube radio setting um, in my parlor in here. I have a Victrola and lots of records, but uh, that's... Uh, and I like that better because yeah. as much as I love my, my tube radio, um, when I fire it up, it just doesn't play the music I want to hear. It, there is a solution for that. Yeah, uh, actually, um, you can get a, uh, uh, a, a low-band transmitter, mm -hmm. like what you would use. Uh, remember back in the day when oh, yeah. you, you couldn't hook your CD player up to your car, so you would yeah. hook it into this device that... yeah. yeah. It works the same way. It plays off low band. So you set your radiola for like 87.9 on the dial and set your transmitter. You can buy them off Amazon for a couple bucks. I don't know. They're maybe 30 bucks tops. Um, and then it uses Bluetooth to connect to your phone. Okay. And so you put the period music on your phone and Bluetooth it onto a low band transmitter that your radio picks up. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. There's, there's modern solutions to every period problem. What else we got? Anything else? Uh, yeah, tell us you. when and where you're going to be event wise. Uh, I wish I knew. Um, I am, I'm currently trying to uh, get permission to attend the old car festival. Um, but there it's a big event and it's kind of popular and it's tight space. And uh, it's, it's a, almost an invite only sort of thing. And I'm trying really hard to get an invite. Uh, <laughs> so um, I'm hoping to be there. Um, I'm going to, um, as soon as the, uh, uh, what's the place in Tennessee, the um, Sergeant York Museum in Tennessee, as soon as they uh, settle on a civilian event down there, I will definitely be on board uh, because I love all the guys down there. Um, and uh, other than that, I'm not entirely, I will be at, at uh, West Baden uh, for their vintage weekend. Um, definitely want to go up there and check that out. So that's uh, uh, second weekend of September. And um, hopefully, hopefully there will be other things to do and, and uh, I'll be able to get out there and, and get on the road some more uh, here soon. I've, um, I've been off the road for, for a long time and I need to get back on. So. Definitely miss you too, Brian. Um, yeah, we, we miss you, Brian. Up to do. Yeah, we need to get you, uh, get you on here with us next time. Some, some period coins. I, I do have a few. Um, oh, oh, on my watch. Sorry. Thank you, Naomi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. The watch is, uh, it's a reproduction watch, but it, it is a wind, uh, wind up watch. And then I have an 1876 half dollar. Um, the chain is an original chain and, and the half dollar is an original half dollar. And when I initially wanted a coin to put on my watch chain, I was looking for one that was just worn and damaged in bad condition so that I wouldn't feel bad drilling a hole in it. Um, and then I happened to find this one on eBay that already had the hole drilled in it. Somebody had already worn it on their watch chain. So I hurried up and snagged it up um, and, and put it on my watch. And 
what I really like about 1876, I really like Wild Bill Hickok, and that was the year that he died. So 1876 really resonated with me. It was also the American Centennial. Yes, it was the American Centennial. Um, so there, there's a lot of, lot of interesting history going on in 1876, and I like the date on it. It had the hole, and so I, I went for it. Um, have you ever been to the Pop-Up Camper History website? I have not, and I'm very curious, and I'm going to look that up as soon as this is over. Um, I will say that the, um, uh, the RV Hall of Fame Museum in Elkhart, Indiana is fabulous. There's some really cool stuff there, including one of the oldest known trailer campers that's not a pop-up. Uh, they have uh, that up there as well as some, some early RVs and other trailers. Um, boy, we got the comments coming in now. <laughs> Nobody wants us to stop. <laughs> um, 1916 Indiana Guard impression. That's really cool. I uh, love that because I'm a Hoosier myself. Um, so that's something else that people can do. If you already do World War I reenacting as an American GI, uh, something really cool that you can do for a civilian era event is a recruiting station. Uh, I would love to see somebody do a great recruiting station impression. Uh, and, and Indiana National Guard would be great for that as well. You could, you could be out there trying to sign boys up for the, um, for the punitive expedition or for uh, World War I. So uh, that's something else that could be done. Uh, do you use any 1920s lamps and bulbs? Uh, yeah, so um, we don't take those camping very often because of the limitations of electricity in the field. Um, but uh, although that is entirely feasible, if you get yourself a uh, Delco light plant, uh, hit and miss engine that, that runs a dynamo, uh, you could have electricity in camp. Uh, that's what's great about this period is you can do anything. Uh, <laughs> I have a flashlight that uses D cell batteries that's 100 years old. Um, so, uh, so as far as lamps and stuff, uh, most of what we use at, at events is, or camping by ourselves is, is going to be a gasoline powered, uh, mantle lamp or, uh, lantern. And, um, uh, I do have, um, a couple of early lamps that I've got modern Edison bulbs in, uh, but I do have a, um, magic lantern projector that's from 1912 and it still has the original Edison light bulb in it. And that will show up in a uh, artifact of the week here eventually, uh, as soon as I get a chance. Um, so anyway, uh, oh, there's a World War I recruiting muster event in Arkansas. Cool. I will have to look that up. That sounds neat. Um, uh, let's see. French rail light. Cool. <clears throat> All right, guys. Well, we have had a great time, but I'm starting to lose my voice. And I, I, I know Josh is probably tired too. So, uh, so we're going to sign off here. Um, but this has been fantastic. We really enjoyed uh, everything that you guys put out here. Uh, had a great discussion. And this has been so much fun. And I think we will do this again sometime in the future. So thank you so much. Have a great evening. Nice. Right. We'll see you down the road. Oh, that was cool. <laughs>